I know you've been in Romans uh, recently. I listened to Pastor Kasiri's message uh, last week, and, and you've been in Romans, but I'm just going to take a little detour this morning, and we're going to go into Luke. And so turn our Bibles to Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. In our text this morning, we will see Jesus telling a parable. And it's a, it's a parable that we've seen before. We have a father, and we have his two lost sons. And could I humbly ask that we stand for the reading of God's word? Would that be okay? Thank you. Um, the parable of the prodigal son. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the, one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran, and embraced him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said, said to his, his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, and kill it, and let us celebrate." Let us eat and celebrate, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field, and, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, and he answered his father, Look, this many years I've served you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that, that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lo lost and is found. Please be seated. Let's, let's pray before we go to God's word this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, I thank you this morning for giving us another opportunity to come before you in worship and praise. I thank you, Lord. You are the only awesome and holy and perfect and sovereign God. I pray this morning that we would listen intently to your word. I pray that we would consider your ways and that we might delight in your decrees. You have spoken in, many, in various times and in various ways to your people in the past, but in these last days, you have spoken through your Son, the incarnate word. Give us hearts that would not neglect your word this morning. I lift up the uh, United States to you, Lord, our leaders, those who are tasked with making decisions in our country, that they would put down any impure motives and pursue the right path for our country. I pray for the local community here in Lakeville, and this church body here at Lakeville Christian, that you would continue to oversee all things here, that Lakeville Christian would be a shining light to their community here. There are people just outside these doors here today that desperately need the gospel. Please give the leaders here in the congregation the courage to be the kind of Christians you've called them to be. 
Please be with pa the pastor, Pastor Dan. Guide him as he travels. Please continue to give him the strength needed to continue to do the work that you've called him to do. Dear Lord, oh dear Lord, open our eyes. Open our eyes that we might see the wonderful things that you have laid before us. It's a miracle only you can perform. And I pray that you would be glorified now through your word. In dear Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Derek Redman. Derek Redman was an Olympic runner who told us a story about a day that changed his life. In 1992, Derek was at the peak of his athletic abilities, and you may have heard this story. And on the day he took his, his spot on the starting line position uh, during the, the Barcelona semifinals, his father Jim was there to watch his Olympic son compete. And this is how Derek tells his story. He said, when, Derek, when, he, when he took the place at the starting blocks, he felt good. He was confident, and when the gun went off, he got off to a really good start. He got into his stride, running around the first turn, feeling comfortable. Then he heard a popping sound. And he kept running for another two or three strides. And then he felt the pain. He thought he'd been shot. The pain was excruciating. And he grabbed the back of his legs, falling to the pavement. He had snapped his hamstring. He looked around to see where the rest of the runners were. And he remembered thinking, if I can just get up, I can catch him. If I can just get up, I can qualify. But the pain was intense. And there he was, lying on the track in pain. You see, four years earlier, in 1988, Derek was there at the Olympics. And Derek didn't even make it to the starting line because of an Achilles injury. And he had the letters next to his name, D-N-S. And that, in the Olympics, stands for did not start. And here, in 1992, here he is again, lying on the ground in pain. We're going to go back to that story at the end. It's likely that many of us here have heard the story of the, of the prodigal son, or at least you've heard the term prodigal. But as we go over it today, I hope you will hear it in a new light, that something will come to light that you haven't heard before. Parables are stories. They're stories that are intended to teach a lesson or to make a point. And they often use familiar situations, some familiar persons, events, or circumstances to illustrate, uh, some, uh, illustrate a spiritual truth. So a parable told today would likely speak about something recent, something in 2022. Hopefully nothing to do with COVID. Jesus' teaching was filled. His teaching was filled with these stories to express spiritual truths. Over one-third of his instruction was done by way of story. The parable here in Luke 15, 11 is preceded by two other parables that we didn't read. And we're not going to go over these parables, but I'll tell you a little bit about these parables. And you may be familiar with those prior parables already. In Luke 15, uh, we see a couple of things. Jesus' is, Jesus is audience we have, we have Pharisees, we have tax collectors, we have scribes. They were all present. The religious leaders of the day were present there. And the Pharisees were complaining that Jesus was associating with sinners. So what does he do? He tells them some parables, right? And in Luke 15, 1 through 7, we have the parable of the lost sheep. You guys may know the story. And the story is, man has a hundred sheep. <coughs> One goes missing. What does he do? He leaves the 99 sheep behind, goes in search of the one sheep, finds it, picks up that one sheep, throws it on his shoulders, and brings it home. They go home and they rejoice, right? You remember the story. Now, Jesus boldly, Jesus boldly tells his audience these words in verse 7. Listen, he says, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents, then over 99 persons who need no repentance. Hold on to that. Next parable, we have a lost coin. Same crowd, same audience, Pharisees, sinners, tax collectors. In verses 8 through 10, we see a woman has 10 coins. She loses one coin. Now, that's 10% of her wealth. She searches intently for that one coin, and then she rejoices when she finds that one coin. 
And Jesus, Jesus uses this lost coin, and, and he, says, he says, Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, to properly understand our, our parable this morning of the prodigal son, we need to zoom out a little bit and to see how it fits within the context of the other two. Context is king. We have to look at our scriptures in the context. And that's why I mentioned the prior parables. Now, our parable this morning, we're not talking about sheep. In our parable this morning, we're not talking about sheep. We're, we're not talking about coins either. In our parable this morning, we're talking about a son and his loving father. That's what we're talking about. We've gone from an animal to 10% of someone's wealth to a beloved son. In our parable this morning, we see different seasons of life. We see very dark seasons followed by very bright seasons, and we can all relate to that. Dark seasons of life followed by very bright seasons. Dark seasons make take many different shapes and sizes. They're all painful. Here in our text, I'm going to spill the beans nice and early. You guys are going to have to figure this out. Our Heavenly Father, right, has always been recognized as the earthly father of this parable. We see Christ as a father. The younger son is a picture of a rebellious sinner who turns from God and runs into open worldliness. The older son is a picture of a works righteous Pharisee. Remember, those Pharisees were there. They were present at this time. The older son, he's a picture of those Pharisees. Now, this, this self-righteous sinner who is outwardly many things, right? The, the older son, he's perhaps even outwardly righteous in the church, but inwardly, we see someone without faith. Both, both sons are lost. Both sons must return. One does return, but the other, we're not sure about. Although it's, although it's called the parable of the prodigal son, this is really a parable of the two lost sons and their father. I think the parable should be renamed Two Lost Sons because the older son is just as problematic as the younger. But since struggling seminary students are not given the job of renaming large sections of the Bible, it's going to have to stay, all right? So first, first the father. Um, the father has an estate. He has hired workers. He has had, he's got enough assets. Remember, he was able to give a significant amount away, clothes, the rings, the calf. The father in this parable is the fulcrum. He's the axis. He's the center. And so you should note that these two sons are going to rise and fall in relation to their proximity to this fulcrum. Um, we should note that the problem with this younger son, it doesn't start after he's gone away to squander the money. The problem with this younger son starts right here in the father's presence. This younger son has everything. He's got everything he could need. He, he has everything he could ever want right here. He's got food. He's got protection. He's got servants. He's got clothing. He's got a nice bed. Why would he leave? Why would he leave? And why would he go somewhere where there's none of that? Why would he go to the far country? Why would he go there? Why do any of us go to the far country? The far country, it, it, it may look different in all of our lives. It, it, can be, it can be any decision that pushes us, that pushes God away from the center of our lives. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. It's the story of Israel. It's the story of mankind since the beginning. In the Old Testament, Israel disobeyed God and wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. It's, this, it's that story. It's a story of a child who grows up in, the, in a Christian home and then wanders from the faith. It's a story of a, of a husband who has it all and walks away from the home to pursue his selfish desires. It's a story of an addict who has made great progress with their struggle and then goes back to feed the addiction. It's a story of a teen who's baptized in the church, maybe this church, and then goes off to college and we wonder, what happened to them? What happened? You see, this younger son, he's got a better plan in mind. Essentially, he says, Dad, I've got this. I don't need you anymore. 
Uh, Dr. Lamerson, who was the uh, former president of Knox Theological Seminary, he said, he said, you have to understand how offensive even the request of this son is. What he said was, essentially, he's saying, he said, when, when this boy asked for his inheritance, he's essentially saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. Now give me my inheritance because you're going to die anyways. The young man's heart, it's no longer with his father. Either he doesn't realize or he doesn't care how fortunate he is to have a loving father who is willing to care enough to look over his shoulder at this young man. This young man makes an intentional, willful decision to get out from underneath his loving father's eye of protection. And in verse 12, we learn that the loving father doesn't, he does not, he doesn't, he doesn't argue with this son. We don't see an objection from the father. In fact, it, that doesn't appear to be the point of the section at all. No, the younger son, he doesn't deserve anything. He doesn't deserve it. But the loving father, he gives it anyway. One commentator notes that our loving father does often give without objection, even to the sinner life, health, faculties of mind, body, earthly wealth, a thousand advantages. And he gives so much that we just take for granted. And then you get up in the morning, you hear the, the birds chirping and, and the sun rays breaking through the clouds and, and the friends, the family, the roof over your head. And, and the sun has all of his needs met. But he will go his own way, right? He knows better, right? He thinks that apart from his father, he will be better served. And that's, and that's a huge mistake. And yet so many make that same mistake. And yet it's important that so, we understand that so many people are just ruined by pride, a foolish ambition to be independent from God. God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, you know, don't touch that tree. And, and, and they just knew better, didn't they? And they ate and they separated themselves from God. Maybe that's someone here. Maybe that's someone here that, that thinks they know better. That thinks, have you tried to venture to the far country? We have to ask, how's that working out? Well, we get to see a firsthand example how that works out. And I want you to see this a better way. Verse 13 in your text, if you have your Bibles, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and, to, and, and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property and reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. This young man just drained the whole account. Sucked it dry on foolishness and sin. Having spent everything is both a really, really bad thing and a really good thing here. And we should look at both of those. It's, it's a really bad from his perspective, from his perspective, because he, has, he no longer has any money to continue the pursuit of the treasures that this world has to offer. And there he is, no money, no food, no idea where his next meal comes from, and famine came. You see, famine in the time of Jesus, right, was not like it is today. There, are no, there were no stimulus checks back then. It didn't exist. Famines kill people, they starved, and they died. That's what happened. So, in verse, so what does this younger son do? Verse 15. He goes to work for a pig farmer. Now, you may say, well, what's wrong with feeding pigs, right? You need to understand that feeding pigs would not be a desirous job for a young Jewish boy. It would be wrong in a variety of levels. Number one, it's wrong spiritually, because as a Jew, you may know this, he's not supposed to be around pigs, never mind caring for them. Number two, it's wrong physically, because he's likely eating pig food, right? And number three, it's wrong mentally, and I think this is a really bad one. It's wrong mentally, because he would think now, he would think now about, about how at one point he had everything, and here he is, he has nothing. And I said the fact that he spent everything is good as well. It's good because he has no more money to sustain his pursuit of the treasures, the fleeting treasures this world has to offer. How many of us have gotten stuck in the trap of driving after the treasures this world has to offer? Much, 
of this country has. At the start of 2022, 64% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck. Richest country in the world living paycheck to paycheck. Well, this young man has spent his his whole paycheck. He's in a place now where he has to depend on someone other than himself to provide for his needs. Now, he will have to experience what it feels like when you no longer have someone in your corner looking looking out after you. One commentator writes, this young man began to be in need, not only because he had lost his inheritance, no, but because he now had no inner soul treasure to fall back on. He had no comfort for the soul in affliction. He had no comfort for his soul at this time. He had lost everything, and what he really needed was Christ. That's what he really needed. What he, re- he lost everything, and what he was lacking was Christ. You see, your portion of the estate will not sustain you. You you can keep saving, you can keep spending, but your soul will feel a void within it that cannot be satisfied until Christ is reigning in it. It may seem like a broken record to hear a preacher that you need to let go of the world and hold, hold fast to Christ, but we, and I put myself in that category, we can never hear it enough. Nothing will produce the same kind of real joy and peace that Christ will. But yet, we're too easily, we let the trash of this world consume our minds, right? The trash of this world take center stage in our hearts. We we, we let the world tell us that it matters. This life offers so many shiny things to fool you into thinking that they matter. I hope I get that pay raise so I can get that new car. Once I get this marriage intact, I'll be all set. I I hope I can make enough to get that truck I wanted. We focus on this life, which is is like 70 or 80. I mean, my grandmother's 100, you know, but just 100 years tops, right? And And we lose sight. We lose sight of something. The billions and billions and trillions of years that come after this life. And if you think that anything other than Jesus can give you the purpose and fulfillment that your heart desperately desires, then you've missed it. You've missed it. It's easy for us to sit here and say, well, this kid should have saved some of it, right? He should have invested some of it. He should have put some of it in the mutual funds, right? But the point is the fact that he takes off to the far country. He takes off rejecting this relationship between himself and his father, at which point he pursues the pointless life. Now, this young man is not alone. He's not alone in breaking the perfect relationship with his loving father. He's not alone in his pursuit of the pointless life. So many today do do the same. But there's a better way. There's a better way. Uh, The son's in a bad spot. He, He made some wrong choices. Jesus Christ in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus says this, He tells us to come to him with our lives. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Praise God for that. Those words come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Uh, One commentator writes, "The the invitation is extended to all, all the troubled. We get a little glimpse of hope in this parable, verse 17 through 20. In your Bibles, it reads, When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Those words there, when he came to his senses there in your text, those are important. Some translations say, um, came to himself, came to his senses. The son stands in the middle of this mess of a life that he created that he put himself into, and he thinks back. He thinks back now to a relationship that was not out of balance. He thinks back to his loving father. This came to himself expression. It's a Hebrew-Aramaic expression for repented. 
It is, this, it is as if to say this, loving Father, I have sinned against you. I have put a wedge in our relationship. I have come to my senses. I am convicted. I need your forgiveness. It's essentially what he's saying. It's a wonderful place to be. This young man realized the hurt that he caused, and he is repentant. And that's important. You see, he can't ever earn his way to forgiveness to his father. It has to be mercifully granted by his father. It has to be mercifully granted. I have a friend that I work with at the hospital, um, and, and he was uh, one of the nurses I work with, and he was, I was talking to him about the gospel, and he said, Josh, I just want to clean up my life. And uh, I, there's a few areas of my life I just got to clean it up first, and then I will come. Like there was something he could do to make his loving father, Jesus, love him more. You see, the reality is that in Romans 5, 8 tells us that God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When did God, God die for us? After we cleaned up the mess? No, right? A few, a few years ago, a few years ago, my, my daughter was asking me, you know, what do you want for Father's Day? And there was this discussion about how I'm a hard person to buy for. And I want to get you a mug. We had lots of mugs in the cabinet. And uh, if I were to ask this father from the parable, and I can't do this, and I'm speculating here, I get that. What is it that you want for a Father's Day gift? He may say, well, I want my son. I want him to come back to me, and that's what I want for Father's Day. And I, the reason why I speculate that is because in 1 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Our Heavenly Father is not wishing that, that any should perish, perish, but that all reach repentance. And in verse 20 of our text this morning, and if you have your Bibles in front of you, it's amazing. It says, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and embraced him and kissed him. There's a sense that his father had been waiting a long time. Like, like a Buffalo Bills fan watching all the games, just waiting, thinking maybe this will be the year, you know. Um, may, maybe his father frequented the roof uh, of his house, just looking out in the distance, right, for his son. Th that's the image I get in my head. Does everyone notice the word ran there in verse 20? It reads, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. It's a wonderful verse there. Running in our culture means nothing. Absolutely nothing. People run for exercise. People run for a slew of other reasons. People run to the mailbox. Now, listen, in the Jewish culture, men just didn't run like that. Men didn't run because they wore robes, and to run was to seem to be undignified, and men of cultures just didn't do this. What does his father running say about his son then? This well-established father was willing to give up his own dignity for the protection and forgiveness of his son. It's a great picture of forgiveness in the New Testament. A picture of a son coming to his senses and repentance and a father running to the son. Too many of us have this picture of God as an angry old man, you know, sitting on his throne, looking down on creation at us. And, and the only way we think we can change his opinion of, of, of us is to do good enough things for good enough time to make him happy. It's not the picture that we're seeing here, is it? It's wildly inaccurate, that picture. What we see here is, is verse 21. Read, read, read your Bible. Verse 21. And, he, and, he, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. No, that son's heart. We started this parable with the son saying, Father, give me my share of the estate. And now you see a changed heart. Father, I have sinned. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Your son. That's a heart attitude that is worth noting. That's a heart attitude that we need to have when we go to the far country. I want you to consider something. Many of us, many if not most of us, assume something about this son. What we assume about this son is he's not going back to the far country. I guarantee you haven't heard this one. Like, like this was a one-time deal, right? But if I were at this party, I would ask to have a word with him. 
I would imagine the music would be playing and there would be the best glass of wine would be in his hand. And I would say, young man, your father really loves you, doesn't he? And he would, he would look at his robe and he would look at his ring in his hand and his shoes and, and he, would, he would hear the sound of the music and he would remember the taste of the wine and, he, and, and he, he may say, I never realized. I never realized how much my father loved me. And I would say, young man, I want you to remember the taste of the wine and the sound of the music tonight and how much your father loves you. And he may shrug his shoulders, because most do, right? And and I would say, young man, you haven't farmed in a while. You haven't been home working in this field in a while. You haven't gotten a sunburn in a while. Tomorrow, when your hands are chafed from the tools and the sun is hot on your back, you're going to think about that far country again. And he would say, no, I'm not. And I would say, oh, yes, you will. Yes, you will. And if you've been a Christian here long enough, you know what I'm talking about. He would say, yes, I would say, yes, you will. You will think of the women, and you will think of the booze. And there was one time you, you will likely return to that country. You won't stay as long. And he would say, no, I'm not. No, I won't. And I said, listen, I'm going to say, listen, when you think about returning to that country, I want you to remember this night, how much your father loves you. I want you to remember the taste of the wine and the sound of the music. And here in this house is where your father loves you. Don't forget those words. For many of us Christians, the father is the, 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 the far country, the far country is not that far away, is it? And it's in the next room. It's a text message away. It's a click away. And I want you to remember the taste of the wine and the sound of the music. And I want you to remember that your father loves you. You need to hear that. Too often, you and I, in this room, forget how much our father loves us. We think he's an angry old man, and we have to earn our way. I want want you to stop, and I want you to just note one thing here. Many of us like to associate with this parable. We say, yep, that's me, that's me, I'm the pair, I'm the prodigal, and let me tell you my story and what happened to me, and, 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 and this is my, my story. But um, in many ways, excuse me, in many ways, we're more often like the older son. And as you read through this text, you will see that he's just as lost as the, older, as the younger son, even though he didn't squander the inheritance. He's just as lost. Now, see, I want you to see the response of the older son. Look at your Bibles. It's just ugly. Verses 25 to 28. Now, his older son was in the field, excuse me, and he came and he drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, this many years I have served you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes, came, who have devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? Well, now why would he be upset, right? Why would he be upset? Well, uh, the older son Hadn't gone and squandered this inheritance, did he? He never did, right? He stayed behind, didn't he? He took orders from the father, didn't he? He stayed and kept the property intact. He hadn't defiled themselves with prostitutes. It is as if he is saying this, Dad, listen, I followed all the rules. I deserve to celebrate with my friends. I have put the work in. I deserve. Now, Not that older son of yours, not that younger son of yours. He wandered off to the wrong side of the tracks. And you're going to have a feast for this ingrate? You've got to be kidding me. That's what he's saying. And this older son, under all this anger, is essentially saying, this younger son of yours doesn't deserve the grace that you're giving him. That's what he's saying. I do. That's what he's saying. He doesn't deserve the grace that you're giving him, but I do. But in reality, what we need to come to terms with in this room is that we are all sinners. 
No one is deserving of the grace of God. Not one of us in this room is deserving. The older brother thought that all of his righteous deeds would earn him a ticket into the kingdom. But it's only the grace of God. When I was uh, uh, taking Hebrew, my professor, he had this funny Latin term that he would use. It was called sola bootstrapa. And it, you, you, you came to understand that this term meant there is no other way to learn this material. You've got to pull yourself out by your bootstraps, and you have to learn it, sola bootstrapa. And uh, it was funny at first. It was really funny, right? And uh, after a while, I stopped laughing at that joke. It was no longer funny. And, and so pulling yourself up by your bootstraps doesn't work your way to Christ. It may work in Hebrew class. It does not work your way to Christ. Some may say, but Josh, I've been coming to this church in Lakeville since preschool. Uh, I lead the Sunday school class here in Lakeville. Um, I sit on all the right boards here, don't you know? Right? But it doesn't work that way. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells us, for it is by grace, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Romans 12, 1, Paul, he was a Pharisee. Paul said, no, no, no. Paul said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. How? How, how Paul? How do we do that? By the mercies of God. Oh, God, have mercy on us when we act like that older brother. When we look at someone else's life and we scour, when, when, you, when you see someone else get the job that you were, you were supposed to get, right, and you didn't get the job, you think you deserved it? You see someone else going on vacation with their family, you know you can't afford that vacation, and you grumble? You see another person in perfect health and wealth, maybe a family member, and you say, God, why did they get all the healthy genes and I got these genes? Why, God? Why are they healthy? I deserve to be healthy. I deserve. And what we say when we grumble like this is, all you have done for me is not good enough. I want more. I deserve more. You see, the fattened calf was to celebrate. It was to celebrate the return of the lost son. The, the fattened calf was not killed to celebrate a life of sin. No. But listen, there was an empty seat at the feast that day. An empty seat. It was a seat that could have been filled by the older brother. The older brother could have had his plate of food as well. The food was there for him. It was getting cold, but he wouldn't take the food. He wouldn't have it. But what greater thing is this than Christ shed blood for us? Christian, Christ is taking your place. For, for the one who does, no, does not know Christ, you're chasing the wind. I'm telling you, if you are searching after something else, you are chasing the wind. You are pursuing a pointless life. I'm telling you. Stop. Come to your senses. Come to the feast. Come to where we have the sound of the music and the taste of the wine and your loving father. That's where I want you to come. I started with the story of the Olympic runner, Derek Redman, and I'm going to finish the story. There he was lying on the track in pain. His hamstring was snapped. Well, somehow, excuse me, somehow he got up and he hobbled about 50 meters until he was about the 200 meter mark. Then he realized it was all over, it was all over. And he looked up around him and he saw everyone else had crossed the finish line, everybody else. But he didn't like to give up on anything and he decided he was gonna finish that race, that race, if it was the last race he ever did. He got up, started hobbling down that track, tears in his eyes. All the doctors and the officials were coming onto the track. And they were trying to get him to stop. Stop running. He was having none of it. Then, with about 100 meters to go, he became aware of somebody else on the track. Jim Redman, his loving father, his dad, was watching from the stands. Jim was making his way over to his son on the track. 
Jim ran onto the track. Derek at first didn't realize it was his dad. His dad said, Derek, it's me. You don't need to do this. Derek said, Dad, I want to finish this race. Get me back into the semifinal. And Jim said, okay, well, we started this thing together. Now we will finish this thing together. Jim managed to get Derek to stop, to stop running and just to walk. And he kept reading, he kept, he kept repeating, you're a champion. You don't have nothing to prove. They hobbled over the finish line, arms in each other. Just Derek and his dad, his loving father, the man he was close to, who supported his athletics career since he was seven years old. Standing ovation that day, 65,000 people got up. Derek's dream was over. But the part of that story that struck me was that four years earlier, Derek didn't even get to the starting line because of, those, because of the Achilles injury. He had those, those letters, DNS. In the Olympics, if you don't finish, they put other letters next to your name. It's DNF. Did not finish. And Derek said, I will not have those letters. Did not finish next to my name. Loving Father, I need you to put my, your arms around me to get me through that finish line. Like our younger son in the parable, I want to I end by circling back to the verses that I skipped, which were 22 through 24. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. A sinner has repented and cast his life on Christ, which is a reason to celebrate. Oh, what a joyful time it is when men and women throw off the empty pleasures of this world and put, put on Christ. Calvin used to talk about that all the time, putting on Christ. Some of you have been praying for so long for others to come to know, come to know this joy. Maybe you've been praying for 10 years for someone that you know to come to Christ. Maybe, you've just, maybe they've been praying for you and you happen to be sitting here today. I invite you then to know Jesus. Know Jesus. Know this loving Father as your personal Savior. Don't let another day go by, for tomorrow is not guaranteed. The prodigal son in this parable paid nothing for his ability to return to his father. He repented of his sins, he got up, and he went back to his father, and his father did not give him the cold shoulder. He ran to his son, he celebrated. I encourage you, come to your senses, as this young man did, and run to him. Let's pray. There was a prayer book called Valley of Vision, and, and the prayer this morning is from that book, um, Valley of Vision. It's, it's titled, Oh My Savior. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us. We are slow to learn. We are so prone to forget. So weak to climb, we are in the foothills when we often should be in the heights. We are pained by our graceless heart, our prayerless days, our poverty of love. We are pained by our sloth in this heavenly race, our sullied conscience, our wasted hours, our unspent opportunities. We are blind while light shines around us. Take, please, Lord, the scales from our eyes. Grind to dust the evil heart of unbelief. Make it our chiefest joy to study thee, to meditate on thee, to gaze on thee. Sit, Lord, make us sit, Lord, like Mary at thy feet. Let us, let us lean like John on thy breast, appeal like Peter to thy love. Let us count like Paul all things dung. Give us increase in progress and grace so that there may be, may be more decision in our character. Give us a vigor in our purposes, more elevation in our life, more fervor in our devotion, more constancy in our zeal. As we have position in this world, keep us from making the world our position. May we never seek the creature, may, may we never seek in the creature what may be found only in the Creator. And dear God, if there's someone here today that doesn't know who Jesus Christ is and why He came, 
that they may be broken and hurting in very deep, dark seasons, seasons of life, Lord. I, Lord, I pray you'd be with them. Maybe someone is pondering going back to the far country in this room. I pray that they would see that Jesus shed his blood for them. That they would see this world as fleeting and hopeless and turn in faith and place their trust in your son Christ. That they would be like the prodigal son and they would return to you. Lord, forgive us the times. Forgive us for the times we have like the older brother scorned this life that you have given us. When we have wished for a life that's other than the one that you have predestined for us. When we have thought we deserve anything, and when we have thought we can earn our way to you, we deserve nothing. We are the sinners on the wrong side of the tracks. But you, Lord, are gracious. You, Lord, are merciful. You made payment for our sin. In your Son is all we need, and in your Son is all we need for life and life abundant. In dear Jesus' name I pray, amen.